Ladies and gentlemen, alumni of both the MIT Sloan Club of New York, other MIT clubs, and the Columbia Business School Alumni Club of New York. Thank you, and I hope you'll enjoy this hour with Brian Festerstonehaw, who is going to be talking to us about the resilient leader. And on the subject of resiliency, Lori Rosenfield, who was to be our moderator, unfortunately at the last minute had to withdraw. She has a family emergency and we're gonna discover as a group just how resilient we are because I'm gonna be covering for her and uh, Brian, who uh, uh, I know has to be resilient to be talking on this subject, should do quite well, we'll see. Brian Festersonha is globally recognized expert in the field of talent transformation. He spent the first part of his career building global brands and helping companies transform the digital world. For 14 years, he was the CEO of the Ogilvy Group's digital marketing company, working with some of the world's most famous brands, including IBM, American Express, Unilever, Nestle, Google, and many others. He later pivoted his career to talent transformation, working with the Ogilvy uh, Group as their global chief people officer and with its parent, com parent company, WPP, a senior talent advisor. He is the author of the award-winning international book, The Long View, Career Strategies to Start Strong, Reach High, and Go Far. And that is available at Amazon and I'm sure many other uh, uh, places as well. And he is a frequent lecturer at top institutions, including Columbia, Yale, McGill, Harvard, Vanderbilt, and the MIT Sloan School of Management, where he's been a major speaker for fellows of the Sloan School here in New York, including this past fall. In 2021, Brian was named to 100 Coaches, the world's leading community of experts in leadership development and ex executive coaching. Uh, so Brian, take it away. And when he's through, we'll have Q and A, both those that I will ask and questions mm -hmm. from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And thank you for uh, stepping in. Thank you everybody for showing up today. I know there's a lot of choices that you have. I have some uh, longstanding and very fond connections with both MIT and the Sloan School and Columbia. So it's great to have you here. So for the next hour, the topic is resilient leadership and more importantly, how to help you become an even more resilient leader. Uh, I'm going to very rapidly give you some of the grounding principles, the, the core ideas behind resilient leadership. And then, as Larry mentioned, we're going to open it up with uh, lots of time for Q&A. So if you'll give me a moment, I'm just going to share my screen and share uh, a few of the the core thoughts. Just wanted to confirm, Larry, everybody, can everybody see that okay, Colette? All good? All good. good. Okay, thank you. So let's start with, uh, start with a definition. So resilience is the ability to embrace change, overcome adversity and to bounce back and all of those things are important and it's not just about surviving or frankly putting up with a lot of a lot of bad things it's the ability to consistently perform at a high level regardless of what the world throws at you uh, i've been studying uh, for several decades the whole notion of leadership and resilient leadership and it's very, very much in the news these days with uh, pandemic and other things. But this is a long term issue. This is not something that's going to go away post pandemic or post anybody's return to the office. This is a very fundamental long term trend. So from my research, uh, from observing a lot of uh, very senior leaders, uh, I'm going to share with you the five hallmarks of resilient leaders and the kind of things that make them differently. So buckle up, we're going to fly through it. And uh, here we go. So the first hallmark is that resilient leaders really know who they are, what they stand for, and who stands with them. 
And this is absolutely critical because no leader can make it alone. I don't think they ever could. They certainly can't in this world of change and world of adversity and world of uncertainty. Because when we are faced with those things, we need to call upon our own core values, our unique, our unique strengths, and also the full power of the people around us. When somebody is assaulting you with change, with uncertainty, you need to make a lot of very difficult decisions very fast. You need some touchstones. And this is where this principle number one comes in. So one of the exercises I do um, in the longer seminars that I do on resilient leadership and also in my coaching practice, I spend time really making sure at the beginning that people understand who they are. I call the exercise, why am I here? And it's got some great questions in it. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Meaning why am I in this part of the world? Why am I in this industry? Why am I maybe in this company? What are my strengths and maybe even superpowers? What are the core values that I bring to solving problems and making decisions? And ultimately, a very difficult thing to write down, but what is your mission and purpose? So if you're just confronted with a blank sheet of paper, some of these are hard to do, but I'll give you a, I'll give you a hack. If you want to come to these answers relatively quickly, there's a couple of great things. One is write down your proudest accomplishments of the past two years. Do one for work and one for you personally. And think about what you actually did. Think about your personal contribution, your special role in that accomplishment. Think about the strengths and powers, relationships, experiences, that you might have <clears throat> brought to bear on that accomplishment and ask yourself why you're proud of it. What makes a difference? And if you go through this exercise, one big one relating to work, one big one relating to, to personal, it's gonna give you some great clues on the answer to who you are, what you value and what's important to you. And I encourage people to supplement it. If you don't have a 360 personal evaluation, it's also a great source of seeing how other people see you. Because sometimes there's hidden strengths that others see that you don't. Sometimes uh, there are core values that you don't appreciate because the fish is the last to discover water. So that combination, personal accomplishment, work accomplishment, and getting some 360 feedback from people you trust and people who know you, who've seen you in action. That's a great place to start this narrative. Every resilient leader has a great sense of who they are and their strengths and core values. But also, you need awareness of what does not bring out your best. What are those barriers, those things today that are stressing you out in life that affect your ability to bring your best leadership game to work every day. And every single person on the planet has these stresses and these problems. And I'd encourage you, uh, I'm going to send along the slides through Colette and uh, Larry. You can take a look at this list and just go through and think in the last year, last 24 months, which of these things have affected you? Concerns about your job today, your long-term career, maybe problems on your work team, parents, kids, partners, physical health, mental health, money problems, sleep, an acute problem with many, many people, substance abuse, addiction, pets, other family members, you get the picture. Just quickly do a, do a checklist of the many of these things that may have affected you. And then think down at the bottom, which are the three of these do you think have the biggest negative effect on your success as a leader at work. And it's very, very helpful for you to understand not just your strengths and values, but what prevents you from bringing your absolute best game every day. Another great part of this principle, number one. And the third exercise I'm gonna urge you to do is to think about your career ecosystem. 
And by ecosystem, I mean the many people who lift and propel you and are decisive in whether you succeed in your long-term career or not. Everybody knows down at the bottom, there's a bunch of connections. There's an MIT alumni group. There is LinkedIn. There's a whole bunch of stuff. But here's what I know. These connections, your email directory, et cetera, they are necessary but insufficient. They are not your full career ecosystem. They're just the raw ingredients. I've never heard anybody say when they retire at the end of a 40-year career, you know, I'd really like to thank my 1,536 LinkedIn connections. It's deeper than that. They're the raw ingredients. They're necessary. They're a great foundation. But think further up this pyramid. Who's your community of experts? By this, I mean could be 50, maybe 100 people in the whole world you can go to for better, faster answers. None of us can know all the answers, but we're called upon. People throw challenges at us as, as leaders all the time. You need excellent quality, fast answers. And your community of experts can be tremendously value, valuable as an asset to your career. By this, I mean, uh, you know, if you're in a supply chain type job, maybe you need somebody with super deep financial and cash flow skills. Maybe you need to really understand the transportation infrastructure. In my own business, I was the CEO of a digital marketing company for a long time. I needed to be an expert in China and an expert in mobile e-commerce and an expert in uh, different aspects of databases and an expert in artificial intelligence and an expert in branding. There's no way I could know all of those. But I assembled a string of people, probably about 75 at, at the peak of a long-term career, a person I could go to for China, a person I could go to for sports marketing, a great person on precision marketing and different aspects of data-driven marketing. You get the picture. Really look at all the tough questions that you get asked in the course of a week or month. Who do you go to? Do you have high quality people you can go to, they make a huge difference. And you need to reciprocate with them. You need to say, can you help me out? But also, when they ask for your help, you reply with a quality answer quickly. And that creates great momentum in your community of experts. The next one up is critical colleagues. And these are the you know six to 10 people in our current jobs who completely control our destiny, whether we succeed or fail. One's always the boss. What's your relationship with your boss? What's your relationship with critical peers? What's your relationship with people who work for you? Do they want to work for you? If you left to a different department, would they go along with you? That's the value of that critical colleagues. One of the ones in there that people often miss is, what is your relationship with your boss's boss? And the reason that's important is that if you're ever up for a big raise, a big promotion, a big transfer. Your boss alone cannot make that decision. So you need to have some kind of positive relationship with your boss's boss because they will be the ones to approve those bigger moves. So again, in that critical colleague, 6, 10, 12 people, really understand who they are. And if you have a neutral relationship, push it to, po push it to positive. If it's positive, keep it. And if it's negative, at least neutralize it. Next level up is what I call the champions. These are maybe five people. It's almost always a number of people you can count on the digits of one hand. I also call them the people you'll meet in career heaven. These are the people that over the long haul have been mentors, champions, advocates, like a tailwind for you in your career. And I just urge you, think of who they are. It might not be five, it could be one or two or three. They're precious relationships. It's not HR. It's not, often not your boss. They can be inside your company. They can be inside your industry. They can be outside your industry. But they're the kinds of people, kinds of people who recommended you to MIT, <clears throat> excuse me, or to Columbia. Kind of people who actively say good things about you behind your back. This is a super powerful concept. 
Think of your whole career ecosystem, not just the Rock Connections, the experts, critical colleagues, champions. And I put you at the top for one simple reason. There's 7.8 billion people on the planet. There's only one who will be with you through your whole career. It's not your spouse or partner. It's not HR. It's not your boss. It's not a headhunter. It's you. And so you need to be the pinnacle of your career ecosystem. So that's the big one, the most foundational one. Hallmark number two is resilient leaders really know how to invest their time. And they're strategic investors, not just like day traders. So many of us, you get hit with an email, you deal with it, another phone call comes in, et cetera. That's not strategically investing your time. That's something else. I encourage people to create their own time portfolio. What is your the waking hours of your life, quite conveniently, there's about 100 waking hours in a week. How do you spend them today? What chunk of it is work, including your commute? What is, you know, fitness or community, family, teaching and learning? These are some of the big slices where people spend their time. Just to illustrate, this is me. This is an actual picture of me uh, in my 30s long ago and far away, and I was the CEO of Ogilvy, the advertising company in Canada. And I worked hard. I worked 60 hours or 60% of my waking hours were work. I could actually go to 85 for a pitch for a client crisis, but I couldn't cruise there. I was working about 60 hours. <clears throat> and then the rest of my life, I had a young family, two uh, young daughters at that time, I was spending about 20% on family a little bit on community, some work with Goodwill Industries, which I still do, a little fitness, some hockey and stuff. Um, teaching and learning, I discovered even just taking some guitar lessons or doing some, some outbound teaching was a little slice of it. And sometimes it was just chilling, that thing on the left, open or chilling time, about 5%. And this portfolio was diverse enough and I found that the non-work pieces, the teaching and fitness and community, they energized my work. So I was working really hard, including some crises, running a company of 350 people at the time as a pretty young guy. But it was sustainable because it had some diversity in it. In my 50s, I shifted it. The big thing is I took some work stuff, some traditional work stuff, and I flipped it into more teaching and learning. I wrote a book, did more lecturing, did more coaching, did more advising of young startups. And again, I'm an empty nester, so family time is down a bit. I did a bit more in community. You get the picture. I changed my portfolio according to my needs at the time. Don't do this one. This is the portfolio of a burnout, an actual person that I worked with, fantastically gifted, burned out, in his late 30s. Virtually a nervous breakdown, got fired, not from our company, but from a different company where he left. Because he just did basically work. He didn't have enough diversity. And I'd ask him about his cycling. Sorry, I got to work. Are you meeting with Mike and Kelly on the weekend for some gym? No, can't do it. So this is a dangerous profile. And maybe there's a few humans who can work 75 or go to school 75 hours in a week. Most can't on a sustained basis. Once again, use the non-work stuff to energize your work. It lifts you. It makes you stronger. So again, think of your portfolio. And if it looks a little bit too much like this right now, you need some strategies to shift it. And usually it's taking some time out of work, some low yield stuff out of work, putting it into things that are really important to you. Could be your health and fitness, could be family stuff, could be reading a book or writing a play or doing whatever it is. Often, even just one or two hours a week taken out of unproductive work into high productive other things gives, it lifts the whole portfolio, energizes the whole portfolio. Number three, resilient leaders know how to maintain high energy and positivity. And one of the things as a leader is your, you wear your emotional state on your face, in your body language, and in your voice. And it's highly, highly contagious. 
because all the people around you, even on Zoom calls and Teams calls and certainly in face-to-face -face situations, they catch it. And is your attitude worth catching? Because as a leader, it's not just how you feel, it's how you make other people feel. And there's a whole range of resilience tools that are available to you that people have used extremely successfully to boost everyday energy. Intent, when you go into a day, are you clear? What is the single most important thing for me to accomplish today? And write it down and put it in your calendar. And that one act helps you be more energized and purposeful in your day. The other one used to be highly skeptical. This is, you know, gratitude. Some of the resilience experts are quite spiritual. Here's a dumb idea that has totally worked, which is before you get out of bed in the morning, close your eyes and think positive thoughts about a person living or dead. Just choose one, a grandfather, an uncle, a mother, father, a grandson, a daughter, a net, whoever, somebody at work, and just think very positive thoughts about them. Why are you grateful that they're around? Think of the good stuff that they brought to your life. And it just helps you combat, because a lot of us wake up and we read the news. Ukraine goes to hell in a handbasket. You know, dumb stuff slaps on Oscar stages. Fight back a little bit of gratitude. It's a really simple idea, tremendously valuable. Discovery, just the new energizes us. It's one of the reasons we love babies. You know, it brings joy to us. So in your life, make sure, look in your calendar. Are you getting some new juice into your calendar every week? Exercise is not about going to the gym once a week and working out, you know, for nine hours or once a month and working out. It's a frequency issue. The work of Tom Rath and others, and you know, whether it's 7,000, 10,000 steps, it's the habit that builds energy. It's the habit. So I encourage people, even if it's five minutes a day, some of my coaching clients, I'm saying five minutes on a Peloton and you can't go to bed unless you do it. And then it goes from five to 10 or 15, it goes to three days a week. It's the habit that matters. You need to understand your energy triggers. There are things in your life that boost your energy, things that bring you down. Real simple, more boosters, less vampires. And finally, breathing. Again, I've, I've been a skeptic that, you know, some of these breathing techniques and yoga and so forth, but I've actually studied them and I found a couple, I'll, I'll share a couple in a moment, are really super helpful. On the, you know, your energy triggers, write down who are the people who lift you up five minutes with Shelly is great and 10 minutes of you know, doing spelling bee actually lifts my energy and doing this and playing guitar for five minutes, whatever it is. Write down your boosters. Also write down your vampires. Who are the people that suck energy out of you? Who are the things, social media in particular, is showing up on a lot of vampire lists? Don't do it all the time. Do it later in the day for an hour, get it over with. Look at your boosters, look at your vampires. Two great breathing techniques. One is the cooling breath, and again, I won't go through it in detail, but it's almost like a rescue inhaler for people who have asthma. You have five minutes, you have a horrible conversation with somebody who works for you, you got a board presentation, and it's just getting in a very calm and square space. Breathing in very slowly through your mouth, over your tongue. It's almost like sipping in energy, sipping in a long, slow breath and breathing out a long, slow exhalation. Physiologically, it helps to unlock the parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve, and it, it, it helps to unlock the whole relax and recover technology that's built into our body. So once again, a cooling breath, you can read about it, you can see it online, but it's in very slowly through your mouth. You can feel it like you're sipping in a cool drink over your tongue. Hold it for a second and then a long, slow exhalation. It's a great thing when you have five minutes. For longer periods, uh, there's a, a more structured exercise called uh, star breathing. Again, you can find videos on it uh, online, but it's breathing in 
little pause, breathing out, long, slow, and deep breaths in each way. And I just use the picture. I use this at night, you know, to sort of relax or if I have a big meeting coming up and I got 20 minutes, I'll often do this exercise and you just, you paint a picture of a star in your head, breathing in, breathing out. And I can go, I call five star breathing. I can go through five, five versions of this and it's a great, a bit more profound relaxation. But think about it. Do you have techniques like this as part of your daily energy? Next one is that resilient leaders lead like the velvet hammer. And the velvet hammer, we all know people on the left-hand side of, of sort of a continuum of leaders who are pushovers. Yeah, whatever you want, I don't care, go with it, sure, sure, sure. They let things happen, they're pushovers. They're not great leaders. On the far right, we know people who are pushy. I don't care, do it, get it done, win-lose negotiators. There's a place in the middle that is strong but warm makes decisions with empathy. That's the velvet hammer. And it's a fantastic technique. If you're not leading like the velvet hammer, I think right now in the moment of the great resignation or the great reconsider reconsideration, the great reset, the great thing about velvet hammers, strong but warm leaders, people want to work for you. They want to work with you. And today, not having enough talent around is one of the most critical barriers to successful leadership. The Velvet Hammer is actually based on conflict management uh, psychology. On the left-hand side, that pass uh, is the passive pushover stuff and it's giving in and my ideas don't count. And on the far right-hand side is very aggressive behavior, attacking, win-lose, other people don't really have rights. And the stuff in the middle is where you want to be. It's the assertive, strong but warm. Standing up for yourself, respecting others, everybody's needs counts, everybody has rights and no one's pride needs to be hurt. We do need to make a decision, but it doesn't have to hurt people. That's a strong but warm velvet hammer leader. And then the final point is that resilient leaders embrace a resilient mindset. They actually go into the world of uncertainty, adversity, and change. And they're okay with it. Nelson Mandela, tremendous example. Do not judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. I've been studying a lot of people who are super, super resilient. The guy in the far right is Travis Mills. He works, um, he's a wounded warrior from, from uh, Afghanistan. He had three limbs blown off. He didn't curl up in a ball. He got through his personal physical recovery. He started a foundation to help other vets enjoy the outdoors, to go fishing, to go hunting. And he's created a beautiful space up in Maine. There's a movie, he, he co-scripted a movie. Travis Mills says, I never quit. I'm gonna carry on, that's resilient mindset. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, many people know, tremendous example of resilience through professional things and physical health and other things. Uh, the guy on the left, you know, a lot of us say, gee, I, I don't, I didn't get promoted on Tuesday. My world is, is disappeared. This is Antonio McLemore. He works with uh, Goodwill Industries, uh, not for profit that I've worked with for a while. Um, Antonio had a job problem. Yeah, he had no job. He had no car. He had... Uh, no house. He was living in a box behind a Rite Aid. He had a prison record and a record of mental health and addiction issues. Antonio got some help from this organization, Goodwill, and got a job. He picked himself up despite all of those barriers and said, I'm just going to go get a job. So he got a job at the Rite Aid. He used to live in a box behind. He got some interviewing skills. He got some clothes, he got some transportation, he got some coaching, he got it done. Tremendous. So there are some great profiles. So I'm just gonna stop there. Those are the big five. If you wanna be a resilient leader, it is a learnable skill. You can become better. You need to understand your strengths and values and your ecosystem of allies around you. You need to invest your time wisely and strategically. 
get right into your calendar to rebalance that equation. You need to use those that toolkit, including breathing and intent and gratitude to maximize your daily energy and positivity. Lead and act like the velvet hammer, strong but warm. It really makes a difference and people want to work with you. And embrace this resilient mindset. I own it. You put the adversity in context. I have problems, I have barriers, but I'm gonna get through this and embrace that mindset. And this is the way to become a more resilient leader. So those are the core principles. Gonna turn it back to Larry. And I think the audience and uh, in the pre-sessions, we have some, some questions. Be delighted to answer them. Brian, thank you. That was terrific. We have chat for Q&A. So if you've got some questions, please put them in and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. I'm gonna start with a couple of my own. Uh, but we also have uh, questions that came at the time of registration and I'll be incorporating some of those with mine. Uh, you've talked a great deal about resiliency of uh, individuals. And in some of your examples, the individuals are leaders of industry, scions in the world, uh, and also someone like uh, the gentleman from Goodwill. So I take it that you believe that resiliency can come from all people at all levels at all stages of their life. Uh, if uh, we take it one step further, yes, we need to be resilient if we're gonna be successful because things get thrown at us all the time. But what about organizations? Uh, not all organizations are resilient as others, even very successful organizations. Uh, I can point out a couple Xerox, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, and there are other examples as well, highly successful Kodak, uh, not so resilient. Can you discuss how a leader or leaders, because it's not just about one person, can help make their organization resilient? So great question. And I do believe uh, that organizations can and must become more resilient because no, nobody knows what the future will hold. They, they, they just don't. It's very, very hard to predict beyond you know a, a three three year horizon if you're lucky but again some a lot of the principles we talked about at the individual level are absolutely true understanding your strengths values and your ecosystem of allies that is exactly how many many successful companies i would credit for example a microsoft microsoft started you know very much in the personal business they got into b2b they were in big trouble in the late 1990s and even the beginning of 2000s. But by understanding their strengths and their values and their partners, uh, I think they did a great job. They invested their time wisely and strategically. That's what companies and boards and CEOs need to, need to do. Maintaining positive energy, et cetera. So I think at least some of these principles, Larry, are very um, applicable and, and resonant at the company level as well, especially points one and points point two. They're the same basic principle. Who are you? What do you believe in? And who are your allies and your, your special assets? That is the essence of resilience, whether it's organizational or at the individual leader level. This is a con uh, uh, question from uh, ji Kim from chat. How do you motivate and energize yourself when you're frustrated at work for a while? <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's a, it's a great question. And I actually have um, <clears throat> to really understand how we're feeling about work. I have four golden questions that encourage people to ask. It could be on your birthday, on your work anniversary, uh, January the 1st. Number one, am I learning? Am I getting new fuel of experiences and skills and relationships? Number two, am I having impact? Maybe on my little team, maybe on the company, maybe on the industry, maybe on the world. Am I having impact? 
Number three, am I having fun? Do I feel like I belong? Are there are joyful moments in my work and life. And number four, am I fairly rewarded? All things considered. Money, maybe some equity or bonuses, and certainly flexibility, which is part of the reward. People give you flexibility in exchange for something. So those are the big four. So uh, for, uh, for, for this question, that's when I find out whether I'm frustrated or not. I really look at those four questions. And if I'm not, first, I try to change my current situation. Because often when you disconnect from something, you, um, you lose some equity, you lose some momentum. So first, is it possible to change? If it's just a money problem, you know, pitch more money. If it's a fun problem, Try and find more fun in your work life. But if it's not there and you really value having fun at work, you got to You got to make a change. You, you got to move, but do a little bit of diligence. These are the big four questions. And the most important of all is learning. I will tolerate some other stuff if I'm learning. Because I've got to, you know, all of us have 40, 45 year career horizons. If you are in a situation where you're not learning, and you've tried and you can't get learning out of it, that's the one in particular you must leave. You have to go to a new place because you're going to screw up your career. So those are a couple of thoughts. Well, here's a related question. Uh, do you believe some people are innately more resilient than others? And when you're in a crisis, you don't have time to be doing what this hour has been all about. You yeah. know, planning and then executing on your plan to build mm -hmm. resiliency as you learn new, you know, ways and methods. Uh, yeah. So if you're in a crisis yeah. and you've got to act, you've got to make decisions. What do you call upon to enable those decisions to be made well? Yeah. And all of us are going to have crises. I spoke to a lot of people, you know, who had crashing airplanes and uh, people who had um, uh, oil fires in the Gulf and, you know, their CEOs did the perp walk, some very, very serious stuff. We also have crises like somebody really good quits. So how do you do? So first, breathe. We make a lot of quite bad decisions in the moment or we curl up in a ball and we totally avoid them. So I just encourage a little bit of calm reflection. And it can be five minutes, it can be 10 minutes, it could be you take a day off or a half day. If you see a big looming crisis, you're gonna need some reflection and breathing time. Number two, it goes right back to the, this, uh, this strengths and values and your ecosystem. In a crisis, you need to know what you're good at, you need to know what you believe, and you, know, you need to know who you can count on. And write down that list because somebody's going to throw a decision at you in five minutes. Look at, uh, we were talking the other day, Larry, about uh, Zelensky in the Ukraine. You know, he wasn't really prepared for war. You know, he had a little bit of a heads up, but he's depending on what am I good at? He's a very, very good communicator. What are my values? I'm going to do what's right for the Ukraine people. And what's my ecosystem? He's got some allies. So he's going to, he's not a general. He's, I, I don't believe he's a super military trained person or great on foreign policy. He's going to strengths, values, and his ecosystem of allies to sort through this unbelievably challenging situation. And the same is true as CEOs and the same is true of leaders at all different levels, you get forced into it. And, you know, the crisis managers say you need to, you need grace under fire. You need to assemble a team. You need to um, make decisions and communicate them. And, you know, you need to not declare victory too soon. Many times in crisis, People walk away, it's bad news. They don't want to deal with it. And they walk away from crises. 
you need to deal with it and apply the learning to future preventative measures. But I, I, I would say breathe and go to principle number one. In an organization, looking at the long term, in addition to needing to have a resilient organization, there were other ideals perhaps to reach out to. And one might argue diversity and inclusion are right up there with resilience. Can you speak a little about those and how they relate to each other? And what long-term planning would you recommend an organization so that say one is not as diverse or as inclusive today, Yeah. how do you get there? You know, diversity and resilience are highly, highly correlated. I think it's extremely, it's like the, that, that uh, time portfolio where you only have one kind of activity. You know, it's, it's like a, a workforce portfolio or your talent portfolio where you don't have enough diversity in it. It doesn't come up with enough interesting and different ideas, doesn't innovate. It doesn't have cultural appreciation in the way that a more diverse portfolio of talent does. So I think, you know, diversity in the same way that it makes your personal time portfolio more robust and enduring and energizing over time. I think it's absolutely true. Uh, it's an aspect, a very closely aligned aspect of uh, resilience, the, the relationship between resilience and uh, diversity. In the, in the talent field, no question. You know, I, I would add uh, that it also helps create product diversity yeah. and market diversity and a resilient organization needs to have many products and many markets. Yeah. Otherwise in this you know, uh, world, it will not succeed. Yeah, yeah, the, the research is very clear, especially Anytime you have a complex solution, mm -hmm. diversity leads to competitively better outcomes. No question. Here's a question from the chat. Uh, who are some of the champions that mentored you? <laughs> and how yeah. uh, was your relationship with them and how yeah. did you benefit? So I, I've, I've had a very long-term career and I've worked 100,000 hours. There's three people that totally made a difference. One, a woman named Shelley Lazarus. She was the chairman and CEO of the Ogilvy Group that I worked in for a long time. An absolute velvet hammer, sparkling interpersonal style, but also decisive and had the real content. To this day, she is one of the best thinkers on modern branding global brands in the world. So Shelley Lazarus, absolutely one. Another was a guy named Steve Hayden, a creative man. He was actually one of the people who did the very famous 1984 Apple commercial. And we worked together at Ogilvy. And he just reminded me the, the, the special magical value of ideas and creative people. And the third one, uh, an entrepreneur uh, from Montreal, <clears throat> when I was growing up through the ranks early in my career, he was just a wise champion and mentor. He um, took the keys to his house, put them on a bank manager's desk and said, I wanted to buy an agency. And he bought an agency that was eventually bought by our company. But he taught me who to trust, when to go forward, when to, when to go backwards. Um, a fantastic, fantastic mentor. So those three totally made a difference in my career. Nice. This is from, and I may mispronounce his name, but uh, Matt Wenicke. What are the things you should do if you've been identified as an internal candidate for a CEO position? I hope that's you, Nat. Uh, and what is the time horizon? Uh, or, and if the time horizon is about three to four years out, so you have some time to plant seeds. Yeah. You know, I. Uh, it, 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 it's a great thing. And, you know, CEO jobs are precious and immensely uh, demanding. So with that kind, I would really think on that my career ecosystem, boy, are you going to need it. As a CEO, you get questions you have no clue. 
You know, you have factories that do things you have no idea. So who's your community of experts and champions? If I had to focus on two aspects of my career ecosystem, it's who's my community of experts cultivate and reciprocate so that you get really great answers to all the kind of questions you think you might get. And then make sure you got, you know, two, three, four, five real champions and mentors, people you can talk to probably outside your, your situation and maybe outside your board of the new company, because you need people to give you candid but helpful advice, sometimes at a very personal level. You will fail. How do you deal with the failure? And it's hard to talk about failure to your current team. So I would really focus on that career ecosystem, especially the champions layer and the community of experts. That would be time, time well invested. We have about uh, 10 more minutes. Yep. Uh, are there uh, some things that you haven't heard from the Q&A or that you would like to bring out? I know you had a, a 40 minute version of your talk that you reduced <laughs> to 20 minutes. What yeah. would you like uh, to, to tell the audience? You know, I, I, I really do encourage people, um, you know, the need for resilience isn't going to go away. And in fact, McKinsey in their 2021 report talked about the ability to embrace and adapt to change is one of the most precious leadership attributes going forward. So you, you have to come to grips with it. So again, these are a number of the, the hallmarks. The hardest part is getting it right into your calendar. And if you don't get it into your calendar, typically you don't actually make progress. You don't actually change. So one of the things, Larry, with this um, being a strategic time investor, the way to do it is actually first to think about the non-work things you wish you could do more of. I have people in my coaching practice that say, I got 10 year old twins. I'm, I'm going to lose them in eight years. And I'm currently not on a pathway to have a great relationship with them. And that's a big gulp. There's very successful people in, you know, C-suite kind of jobs. So by thinking about where they want to spend some time so they know an hour a day doing boxing lessons with their kids or tennis or skiing or arts and crafts or whatever, they're, they have to book them into their calendar, Tuesday, 6 p.m., Thursday, 6 p.m. They find a place that's fairly sacred. They block it out and they do their very best to respect that time. They don't wait for it to open up. They block it. And then once you have built that time, you have a problem on the other side. You need to carve it out. And that's where there's a whole series of activities carving time out from your work. There's only three things. Stop doing the task, give the task to somebody else, perform the task faster. So you need to go through your work week quite diligently. And again, in my coaching work, we go through two week period and we go down to usually about 15 minute periods. What are you spending your time on? Why, why are you doing that? Why are you drafting that? Why don't you have somebody else draft it? You should be reviewing, not drafting. Oh, you know, you and your co-leader are both in that same meeting. Why don't you divide and conquer? Um, you can offload some things. You can, you know, stop doing certain tasks. In professional services businesses, you can stop serving certain clients. It's a big gulp. Nobody wants to give up clients. Sometimes it's fantastic because it frees up a chunk of less productive time you can put into your best customers and your best prospects. So I, I think one, one point to really underscore for anybody who wants to become more resilient, get into your calendar and start by putting the extra stuff, fitness time, reading time, family time, charity, community time, teaching time, whatever it is, start putting that in and it will force you against often your best instincts. How can I carve some hours, unproductive hours out of the work zone without 
but while, while still performing at a high level. You know, you don't want to just, well, I don't work Fridays anymore. That's probably not going to be a great solution to your career ambitions. So getting your calendar is a very significant step for anybody who's serious about resilience. These are really excellent nuggets of advice. Yeah. yeah. But it's easier if the organization you work with or for uh, accommodates these things. Yeah. There's a saying, history is, you know, repeats itself. Yeah. Uh, are organizations really changing? Are they more accommodating to these needs and enabling people in the organizations to become more resilient? You know, and there's the, HR plays a big role in all of this, but yeah. HR gets its direction from the CEO. Yeah. yeah, no, this this is a board and C-suite conversation. Sort of the good news is there's been a wake up call, which is in the law profession, as an example. Oh, my God, none of the associates want to work here anymore. And what is their business model based on making those associates put in 2000 plus billable hours per year? So there's a wake up call in the C-suites of many, many businesses that say, how do we make ourselves more attractive? How do we rebalance the equation? Because this is an, an empowered workforce. And how do we reach, you know, a new sort of exchange? And some of it has to do with, I don't believe so much in backing off the outcomes that are necessary to drive a successful business. But stop prescribing how. Empower the individual to figure out how, when, and where to do a great job. So I'm a big believer in, in businesses. Give people targets. Don't back off on targets. Be more flexible about how and where people get the work done. And it's... And, and high-performing talent does respond well to that. We've seen this all over the world. We're seeing at Apple, a revolt. You know, don't force me back into the office, but it's okay to give me high standards. But don't force me back in two days a week or three days a week after May the 23rd. There's a lot of pushback. So I think there's a wake-up call. I don't think all the boards and CEOs know exactly what to do yet, to be honest. I think they would be receptive sometimes to uh, proposals, you know, coming bubbling up more organically from mid and, and senior level people, even even junior people. Um, so they, they know there's a problem. They know that wellness is on the ascendancy. They know the equation needs to be rebalanced. They don't exactly know how to do it. So that's where as an individual, I would say, hey, boss, give, give me the What's, what does good look like? You want some business outcomes and you probably want me as a leader to contribute to the culture of the company. Sign me up, but don't tell me I got to be there Thursday, but not Tuesday and Wednesday. So one week I might be there eight days a week, seven, you know, six days. Give me a bit of flex. I will get there. One day I'm going to be writing a big, long research report. The worst place in the world to write it is in the office. Because every five minutes, I'm going to get somebody knocking on my door. By contrast, if I'm doing a big pitch or a client thing or a, some collaborative solution, the best place in the world is to be in a single location at the office or somewhere else. So I just urge people, there's a big rebalancing that's going on. Individuals need to be more resilient. Companies need to be flexible and resilient and start the dialogue, starting with yourself. How can you do your best work? Not work less. Do your best work. Build relationships. Still contribute to culture. That's the game that you want to bring. And with resilience, you want to bring it for decades. Brian, that was fantastic. Uh, the, uh, the last uh, answer uh, about empowerment, something that uh, is uh, so, so, so important, uh, and it's so tied to resilience of an organization. Uh, 
individuals at the lower rungs who are not empowered feel frustrated very, very quickly. Yeah. And um, we had uh, <clears throat> another event earlier this morning with a leader from the Air Force that discussed that. You echoed him exactly. Mm. Yeah. And uh, it's not just empowerment about giving a high standard and letting the individual figure out how to do it. And if it's accomplished well, uh, being fine with that. It's also enabling someone to get beyond just a specific task to feel part of the whole, that the mission of the organization and not necessarily the whole organization, but the unit that they're working for, that yeah. they're truly contributing. And they get to learn not just their own task, but many tasks. Uh, any final word, Brian? You know, I just I just wanted to thank uh, the organization, Larry, and also the audience. Again, you got a billion things to do. It's a very busy week, and I'm just glad that you invested an hour in in yourself and a topic I, I really, really believe is critical for for long term careers going going forward. So again, um, uh, I'll send some I'll, I'll send the the slides and a contact version for people who'd like to uh, know more or if they wanted to do some coaching or leadership training or whatever, uh, happy to chat with them about it. But again, huge thanks to the organization and uh, to all the people who joined us today. Brian, I would personally like to thank you on behalf of the MIT Sloan Club of New York and myself. Uh, there's one person also to thank in this. It's Colette Thompson, who is our uh, administrative uh, executive. Uh, nothing happens without her. And I know she was involved with a crisis this morning with that first event I was referring to. Yeah. And she, resilient uh, herself, uh, came back to work this like magic. So Colette, thank you very much. And the audience, thank you. Uh, thank we you have all. a couple of events coming up. Uh, I just want to briefly mention it. Uh, for uh, members of the, uh, uh, the Sloan Club of New York, there's an in-person event with Professor Lowe next week in person. Uh, we've got a space-related event later in the month. Uh, we have uh, an event on uh, the business of quantum computing uh, in uh, a couple of days or next week. And we've got events uh, on uh, women entrepreneurialism coming up in early June and one on ENT investment and measurement. So a lot on the calendar over the next weeks and months. Uh, Colette, Brian, and our audience, and not just from Sloan, but from Columbia Business School as well, thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you.